The situation in Gaza and throughout the Middle East is something our next guest knows a great deal about. He is Martin Indyk, a former U.S. ambassador to Israel during the Clinton administration. Mr. Indyk is the director of the Saban Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution. He joins us tonight as we continue to look at the challenges and opportunities around the world facing the new Obama administration. Ambassador, thank you for being with us. Now that the war in Gaza has ended, what do you anticipate that the Obama administration's first moves in the region will be? Well, President Obama has already made his first move. He made phone calls uh, to some of the key leaders in the region. Uh, he called uh, Prime Minister of Israel, the President of Egypt, the King of Jordan, and, and President of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, he still needs to call the uh, Saudi king. I presume that he will do that in the next day or two. Then he's going to, I think in the next day or two, announce his Middle East team. Uh, there's been reports in the, in the press about George Mitchell, uh, former majority leader of the Senate uh, and former negotiator for Northern Ireland, uh, as the person that he's going to appoint. Uh, I think that's uh, accurate and, and George Mitchell will then be the point person uh, for the Arab-Israeli peace process, uh, which uh, Obama has had promised uh, that he would focus on from day one of his administration. How much more difficult is it to bring peace to the Middle East than it was to bring peace to Northern Ireland? You know, it's funny, I asked George Mitchell that uh, when we worked together at the end of the Clinton administration, beginning of the Bush administration, I was still ambassador in Israel, and he was uh, appointed by President Clinton to head up a commission of inquiry into the origins of the Palestinian Intifada that had just broken out. Um, and uh, so he spent quite a bit of time in Israel working on that. And, and I asked him once what, what was more difficult, and he said that uh, the Israeli-Palestinian issue was much more difficult than the Northern Ireland issue. And partly he explained that that in the case of Northern Ireland, um, you had an agreement uh, that had been struck and, and they were working towards implementation and he was doing that in a very meticulous way. Uh, on the Israeli-Palestinian side, they had, of course, the Oslo Accords that had been agreed on, but they had been observed in the breach by both sides and, and uh, at the end of the Clinton administration, the whole thing blew up into an extraordinarily violent uh, uh, engagement uh, of the Intifada with thousands of people killed on both sides. And, and in the end, uh, the challenge of restoring trust, stopping the violence and restoring trust, uh, and try to rebuild that process was much, much more difficult than in the case of Northern Ireland, where the process basically continued until it, it was uh, uh, both sides had confidence in the outcome. Well, let me ask you this. How did the most recent war in Gaza change the prospects for reaching a new agreement in the region? And, and what would any new agreement potentially look like? Well, in the short term, it's made things much more difficult. Uh, that's essentially because not only is there a great deal of anger uh, on the Palestinian side, um, a feeling on the Israeli side that they still haven't resolved their security dilemma. There isn't anybody on the Palestinian side that would take control of territory in the West Bank, for example, uh, and prevent rockets from being fired into Israel, just like they have been from Gaza. So, there's, on, you know, on both sides, there's a lot of anger, distrust, lack of confidence, and, and that makes things more difficult. In addition, those in the Arab world who would make peace, uh, whether it's Egyptian Jordanian leadership, the Saudi leadership, um, those who have been promoting this Arab League peace initiative that would turn the two-state solution between Israel and Palestine into a 23-state solution with the entire Arab world, they are all very much on the defensive as a result of this crisis. There was just a meeting in Kuwait in which there was an attempt by some of the Arab states to take the Arab League peace initiative off the table. So in those circumstances, in the short term, it's, it's going to be difficult. In the longer term, this crisis could uh, provide a springboard for uh, President Obama and Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton to engage, as they've promised to do, in, in an effort to show that peace and, and reconciliation and compromise can better meet the needs of the Palestinians than uh, Hamas can firing trash can rockets into Israel. Well, before I let you go, though, I want to turn to another part of the region, and that is the relationship of Israel, the U.S., and Iran. There were recent reports that the U.S. had discouraged Israel from taking military action against Iran. Are the U.S. and Israel on the same page? I think they are now, uh, in the sense that uh, the Obama uh, administration 
uh, will be making clear, I believe, that they intend to engage with Iran, they intend to try to use diplomacy to head off Iran's nuclear program. Um, the Israelis clearly were thinking about uh, taking military action at the end of the Bush administration. Once it became clear that uh, essentially the Pentagon was strongly opposed to that, uh, they have come around to accept that it's time for a diplomatic effort. They would rather see the diplomacy succeed if it can, um, because their military option can at best buy a few years, uh, but it will have other uh, very negative consequences. So their preference, I think, is to have diplomacy work, but I think they also understand that if Obama gives it a real good try and the Iranians don't respond, that then everybody, the world, will understand that um, there, there are very few options left but the military option. Ambassador Martin Indyk, thank you very much for speaking with us today.